So I would say, you know, when it comes to SEALs, I mean, one of the most important attributes in Navy SEALs is cunning, because again, the Special Operations Community and the SEALs specifically were created to frustrate and agitate the enemy, to do things that other units couldn't or wouldn't or wouldn't even think of doing, you know? And I know the book, I give the example of the, of the medieval castle, yeah, right? Where the, yeah. you know, the princess is in the tower that's guarded by a, a dragon and the, the king who wants to save the princess, every, every evening sends his best knight to go slay the dragon and save the princess. But every single knight he sends gets incinerated by the dragon. Well, the Navy SEAL shows up and says, okay, sire, what's the, what's the mission? He says, save the princess. He says, oh, well, who cares about the dragon? Okay, and then the seal begins to think about a way to save the princess that avoids the dragon altogether, right? right. That's cunning, right? What are the perceived boundaries? The mission is not slay the dragon, save the princess. Yeah. The mission is in fact save the princess, right? So cunning allows us to proactively take out some of those constraints that we think actually exist. Welcome to the Not Almost There podcast. I am in the home of Rich Davini. Rich, thank you first off so much for you and Kristen for having me here today. Yeah, Joe, thanks for coming. Thanks for taking the time to come. Yeah, you know, it's it's amazing. And and uh, I've really enjoyed getting to know you and, and uh, reading the book, The Attributes. And I just can't wait to dive into the conversation today to better learn how we can use this framework of attributes and everyday life. This isn't just for businesses. This, I believe it's for, to be a better husband, a better friend. Like you yeah. can do really use kind of this framework for everything when it comes to your life. Yeah. Yeah. But I think to start, I really would like to understand why you wrote the book. And I think maybe a place to start there is your time in this in the Navy SEALs yeah. and and how this idea came to be and what you were facing? Yeah, it's a great place to start because I, I hadn't I would never have thought about performance the way I do now had I not gone through Navy SEAL training and of course combat and things like that. And really, what ultimately you know I joined the SEAL teams in 1996. You know, before many people knew what Navy SEALs were. <laughs> um, and of course, you know, going through that career, I spent just under 21 years. It was a very kinetic career, especially after 2001. Um, but I was at a certain point in charge, I was put in charge of training for one of our elite, uh, SEAL teams. And so this was a SEAL selection process, it was a selection process that was separate from the basic SEAL selection, which is BUDS, basic underwater demolition SEAL training, where you, where, where a sailor will go and have, um, uh, it would be about a six month course and it's about a 90% attrition rate. That's basic SEAL training. But that, when you get through that, you are designated a SEAL. And I'll talk about that in a second, but uh, but this specific selection process took very experienced SEALs and put we put them through our own selection to see if they were uh, the right fit for this command. And and at the time we weren't when I took over we weren't able to effectively articulate why we were getting fifty percent attrition. Now of course attrition is expected in any selection process, but but why were these guys who were really already experienced SEALs not making it through our training? Our explanations weren't adequate. We were saying things like, well, they couldn't shoot very well or, or couldn't, whatever, you know, it was uh, very skills based. And I recognized at that moment that we, in the articulation of that process, we had to talk about the fact that we were looking for different things. And so I, I kind of rewound the clock and looked at basic SEAL training and in basic SEAL training in BUDS, you spend hundreds of hours running around with heavy boats on your head and exercising with 300 pound telephone poles and running with those things and freezing in the surf zone. And as I reflected, I said, you know, I, I've done hundreds of combat missions overseas in Afghanistan and Iraq, and never on one did I carry a boat on my head or a 300-pound telephone pole, right? So so the whole SEAL training moniker was incorrect. They actually weren't training us to be Navy SEALs when they were making us do that stuff. They were actually putting us into environments and into situations to, to tease out to see if we had qualities to be a Navy SEAL. And so these qualities, these hidden kind of attributes were what really I keyed into. And I brought that forward to what I was doing in training. I said, hey, we need to start looking at performance from a different optic. Performance is not just about skills. Performance is also about these more innate hidden qualities. And, and of course I did that work and, and, and then continued my career in teams. I got out of the teams. I retired from the Navy in, in early 2017 and began talking about high performing teams and talking to businesses and organizations. And the, the common question I would get was, you know, Rich, we're forming these dream teams, the best 
marketing person, best salesperson, best whatever, best this, best that. We're putting them all together and the teams are great and they're doing great when things are going great. But as soon as things go sideways or things don't go as planned, the teams start to turn toxic. You know, why is that? And for me at that point, it was pretty easy. I said, well, because you're, you're building your team based on the wrong things. You're building them based on skills versus attributes. So that began the distinction. And I began to say, well, someone should probably write a book on this because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> there was a gap. People weren't really talking about it, at yeah. least in the way that is understandable. And so that was the impetus of the book. And, um, and this idea that when it comes to performance, whether it's team performance or human performance, how we perform in every day, um, we have to look at performance more deeply than just the skills we bring to the table and really begin to highlight the differences between the two. Yeah. And I, I want to get into, uh, I love when I hear you talk about the interview process for businesses and, and it makes so much sense. Uh, I want to get into that in a, in a little bit for sure, but I want to kind of back up to when you really started to identify attributes, were you like the first person, in this elite group? So, so first off, we're talking about an elite group of the seals you were in charge or one of the people in charge of this selection process. Were you the first person to say, the word attributes or were people talking about it, but not really defining it? Like how did that yeah. even come to be? Yeah. I realized that, that very few people are actually the first to do anything unless you're like <laughs> Neil Armstrong or something. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the idea is, and I think the bottom line is this is, ha this has been being talked about for decades. I mean, ever since teams began to be put together, people have been talking about qualities and things and the, and, and what is talent and what makes up performance and things like that. But yes, I think for me, um, when I began to break it down that way, and I and then in, in this case, I basically told my commanding my, my command team, and then and then put together committees. I said, "Hey, let's think about and talk about what we're really looking for in a candidate, and let's not think about skills, right? Let's think about things other than skills." So what we did is we began, I basically put together committees and said, "Okay, just make a list of what what makes up a great operator in this command that we are at." And then I would get these lists. Now, inevitably, these lists would have both attributes and skills on them because they get conflated all the time, right? Um, but then you say to, say to yourself, okay, look at this list. Which ones are the skills and which ones are the attributes? And and then once you call away the skills, you're left with these qualities. You're like, okay, this is in fact what we're looking for because you start to understand that these attributes actually um, inform. Well, let me let me let me break down what the difference is. I, I was just going to ask yeah. you that. Okay, here's the difference. Skills are not inherent to our nature. None of us are born with the ability to ride a bike or throw a ball or in the seal case shoot a gun. Okay, we're we're taught those things. We train to do those things. Um, seals are skills uh, direct our behavior in known and specific environments. So so here's how and when to throw a ball, ride a bike, or drive a car or shoot a gun. Now because they're tangible and they're didactic in that way, skills are are, are very visible and therefore they're very easy to see, measure, and assess. You can score them. You can put stats around them. You can put them on a resume. You can put numbers to how well you do those things. Um, the problem with skills is they don't tell us how we're going to show up in uncertainty, challenge, and stress because in an unknown environment, it's very difficult to apply a known skill, right? So this is where we start leaning on attributes. Attributes are innate. Um, we're all born with levels of patience, situational awareness, adaptability, resilience. Now, certainly they develop over time and experience, uh, but we can see levels of this stuff in small children. So, so they're they're innate to our to ourselves. A little bit of nature and nurture in there, I think. Um, attributes also inform our behavior rather than direct it. Okay, they tell us how we're going to show up to a situation. So, so my son's levels of perseverance and resilience, for example. Um, informed the way he showed up when he was learning the skill of riding a bike and he was falling off a dozen times doing so. So they inform how we show up. And then because they're not as visible, they're very difficult to assess, measure, and test. They're very difficult to score, right? You can't sit across the table in an interview process and assess someone's level of adaptability or resilience, right? They are the most visible during times of stress, challenge, and uncertainty, which is what made my laboratory, whether it was the SEAL, SEAL selection I was running or even basic SEAL training, such perfect uh, such a perfect environment because everything about SEAL training is about throwing people into, <laughs> into challenge and certain right. stress. It's all about these attributes. And so, and so what we have to understand is that our performance on an everyday level is driven by these attributes, by these qualities that we show up to the game with. If we are inherently impatient, that is going to affect how we show up to a specific situation versus if we're inherently patient, if we're, if we're inherently adaptable versus inherently have low adaptability, right? So, um, so it was this distinction that allowed us to 
create a new language around what we were looking at. What was neat about what we were doing in, in the SEAL training we were running is we didn't have to change the training at all. The training stayed the same. But now instead of looking at skills, we were looking at attributes because what we recognize is if we could see those attributes that we were looking for, we could always train the skill, right? And so a quick back of the envelope test, if someone wants to determine whether or not it's a skill or an attribute, is to ask yourself, can I teach it or can it be taught? Mm -hmm. If the answer is yes, it's probably a skill, right? Versus if the answer is no, it's probably an attribute. So the example would be, Joe, you could say, hey, Rich, I want to learn how to shoot a pistol and I want to hit a bullseye every time. Well, I could take you to a range and teach you how to do that within a couple hours. Okay, that is a skill. Or you could say, Rich, I want to- Can be we do that right after this? <laughs> right after this, we'll go, right? <laughs> or you could say, Rich, I want to be more patient, right? Or more adaptable. Well, I can't teach you how to do that. So an attribute is something that has to be um, self-motivated, self-directed, and it takes a willingness for that individual to step into an environment of discomfort to test and, and develop one's attributes. So if someone's impatient, for example, and wants to develop their patience, they then have to go find environments inside of which to develop and test their patients. So that, I don't know what that looks like. It could be, I'm gonna go drive in traffic or I'm gonna go stand in the longest line in the grocery store. You know, I always joke having kids is a good way to, <laughs> to right. develop patients, right? But it has to be self-directed, self-motivated. Uh, self so, so that's this key about attributes is they can be developed, right? You can work on them, you can develop the ones you're lower on. And here's another caveat to this. We all have all of the attributes, okay? Um, the difference in each one of us is, are the levels to which we have each. So for example, adaptability, um, if 10 is high and if if one is low, I would count myself probably around a level eight on adaptability. What does that mean? That means that when the environment changes around me outside of my control, um, it's fairly easy for me to go with the flow and roll with it, okay? I'm pretty adaptable that way. Um, someone else might be a level three, which means the same thing happens to them. It's very difficult for them to go with the flow. It's hard, it's painful, it takes work. They're still adaptable, but it's just more difficult. So if we were to line all the attributes up on a wall as like dimmer switches, you know, we'd all have our dimmer switches set to different levels as to what levels of the attribute each attribute we had. And then of course we can work on the ones we're low on if we want to, if it if it applies to what we want to do. So you have 25 that you describe in this book and you categorize them from grit, mental acuity, drive, leadership, and team and uh, team ability. Yeah. That can these attributes, has that list expanded since you, you wrote the book? Well, they, the list was already um, bigger than 25. Um, I, there's more than 25 attributes. The reason why I settled on 25 is because I didn't, first of all, it was impossible to write about all of them. Right. And once I began to bin them in these categories, I really wanted to, to get down to some elemental things. So I'm really interested in what I call elemental human performance, right? That means who are we at our most raw? Like, <clears throat> because we always say the real us shows up when when things go sideways or when we're at our most raw, that's the real us. Well, I'm like, okay, who, who's the real us? Like, who who am I at the worst, at the most raw? This is where attributes start to inform that. And so so I wanted to get the attribute list down to its most raw uh, as I could. And, and, and in terms of how we, in terms of this idea of optimal performance, how we can perform, which is why it ended up being 25 and then it binned into those categories. But yes, there are a lot more than 25. When you're looking at these attributes, is there different phases where these get teased out? So I imagine Buzz is like, that's really physical, that's grit. Um, you have to do everything you can to get your mind and body through that period. But once you succeed there and you get into other things like like underwater training and mm -hmm. yeah. various things like that, does that then flow into the other categories of, of attributes. Um, and it's then a, it's a great question. Uh, oh, go ahead. You're going. Well, well, I, I guess then the follow up to that quickly would be like, is there anything a Navy SEALs like, is there a common thing that they don't have or yeah, they yeah. score low on? Well, or, or too high. So first of all, all the attributes, um, being too high on any of them is, is bad and being too low on any of them is bad, right? So there's a, there's a sweet spot somewhere in there depending on what your, your, what your niche is, right? So just say courage, for example, as an attribute. Way, way high on courage means that you're probably not assess, assessing risk appropriately, right? It means your, you, your fear doesn't show up as quickly for you as it right. does for other people, which means you might have the bulldog approach. And, um, and I, in, in the book, I call the chapter, Beware the Fearless Leader. Because a, a senior officer once told me, one of my mentors, he said, be, he said that, beware of the fearless shooter because they'll likely get you killed. If you don't have someone who is actually assessing risk appropriately, then they're going to run into a situation that is stupid. <laughs> you know, so, so too much is, is, is too much or too little is, is a bad thing, depending on what you're doing. Um, in terms of the, which one showed up, I think this is, a, it, it's a great question because that's where I wanted to get elemental. And this is a big, big mis, misunderstanding about buds and SEAL training is that it's a physical thing. 
right? The thing about Bud, and this is why guys who show up to Bud, sometimes the guys who show up who are the most physically fit are the first ones to quit. Because the first thing they do at Bud's is take you down to zero. I mean, there's only so much, so many push-ups you can do before you can do no more push-ups, right? And they get you down to that pretty quickly. And then they th then they throw you in the surf zone and and just have you freeze, right? And then they make you run with boats in your head, which crushes your spine. And so so the physical aspect they take they take that out of the equation pretty quickly, and then say, okay, now what you, what do you have, right? So these attributes stem from that position, you know. And so so the 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 good news about that is they translate, right? So so the same gr the same grit attributes I used or any candidate uses to get through surf torture or, or you know, uh, you know, boat passage or whatever you want to call it, those torturous events in SEAL training are the same grid attributes that are going to get me by in a long combat swimmer dive or a combat mission that's, that's really rough, right? Those attributes translate. And so, so these, these attributes are, are, they're all mental. They all start inside of us and they inform how we show up, whether it be physically or mentally or whatever. And so, um, so I think the training ground the environment that BUDS provides you, really what it does is two things. It, first of all, it deselects those people who, who don't have enough of what you need, but then it starts to hyper-develop the ones you have, right? So guys like me and guys who made it through, our grit became hyper-developed. All these attributes became hyper-developed because they just we just kept on getting put in those environments. And so, so yeah, at the end of the day, um, I know what grit feels like. I know what those attributes of grit feel like. You know, again, grit's not one thing. It's a combination of things. Right. But I know what that feels like. So that's that's kind of the unconscious genius of that training. Yeah, there's that uh, infamous one-mile stretch, uh, one, the one-mile run that, that you guys just keep doing a mile one after another, and no one tells you when it's going to end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, to me, it seems like the only way to get through that is just one step in front of the next because there's no ending. You can't really think of anything. Yeah. Well, the same thing the same thing's true with Hell Week. You know, um, yeah. Hell Week is basically six days. And um, you start on a Sunday afternoon and you end on Friday. But the, 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 the common understanding in Hell Week, and it's a truism, is that if you think about Friday on Monday morning, you're never going to make it. It's just too much You because you, you can't think that far. There's way too much in front of you. I, I would I, I even argue even on even on Wednesday, I wasn't thinking about Friday because it's just too far away. And so so you you well you both you have to come to the table with the ability to to just gut it out and and chunk it out. Um, but then that that hyper develops it, right? So so the, the, what we had to do to get through Hell Week now translates to a mission that's taking way longer than we thought or uh, or a situation where we lost people and now we have to keep on going. I mean, you know, you know, you lose someone on deployment, right? That you you don't go home, right? You're you're opping the next night. I mean, you 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 have to keep going. There's no stand down that happens, you know. So so you have to be someone who can put things aside and put your head down and gut it out. And this this these, these very basic things allow you to to do that and, and understand how to do it. You do have a, a test or an attributes assessment, I yes. should say. I I took that and and I scored a, I scored like pretty much average on the attributes um, based on my answers. But some of it was I didn't fully understand the definitions of what it was asking yes, me. Yeah, yeah. And then at the very end, it, it kind of provides definitions for you, and then you you answer questions again. So. That said, um, I'm glad to know that you don't want to be too high or too low. Yeah. So that makes yeah, yeah, me feel yeah. good that I was a bit <laughs> average there. Yeah. Um, but you know, knowing you too, before we dive dive into these, so you, one of the things that was loud and clear just from reading your book, from hearing you on other podcasts and meeting a person, like you were always just a you're always approach things in a steady way. You don't come in too hot, right? Too cold. Can you help? us to understand that and the importance of being steady. And is that something that SEAL teams taught you? Yes. Uh, so so is it something the SEAL teams taught me? I'm not sure if they taught me it as much as the SEAL teams force you to develop it. And um, mm -hmm. and so so this is this is where I begin to talk about optimal performance versus peak. And, and I used to get this a lot, um, well, I still do, in terms of people talking to me and kind of coming in with this assumption that SEALs are the ultimate peak performance. Because this whole peak performance thing is a it's a huge fad right now, and I say fad because you know everything has its has its lifespan. But but what what's what I, what I guess is wrong with it is it puts focus on the wrong part. Peak is simply an apex, and an apex from an apex you can only go one place, <laughs> and that's right, down, right? right? So so um, so the idea is you to to be chasing peak all the time is probably somewhat irresponsible and unhealthy. 
Um, seals I recognize are optimal performers. Optimal performance means I'm going to do the very best I can in the moment, whatever the best looks like in the moment. Okay. Sometimes the best looks like peak, you know, but other times the best might be like, I, I am just head down, grinding it out, going step by step. That's all I have right now. That is also optimal performance. That means you're performing optimally in your environment and that's okay. And so what optimal performance allows us to do is a couple things. First, it allows us to pat ourselves on the back during those times where we are just gutting it out and grinding out. We are not at peak. It's ugly. It's dirty. It's grimy. It's, there's nothing pretty about it, but we are moving, right? And we are, we are, we are progressing however slow. That is optimal performance. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but it also allows you this understanding of energy modulation, right? I don't need to be peak when I'm driving to the grocery store, okay? Right. Um, and, uh, and to do so is a, is a gross misuse of my energy levels, right? Um, I need to always modulate myself so I can play the long game because in the, in the game of SEAL life or SEAL missions, in the game of life, you, you don't know when the end is. I mean, you don't know how long it's going to go. And, and that's really how Navy SEALs and I think spec operators approach almost everything. We never go all out all the time, right? Or especially right out of the gate, unless we have to, okay? But it's always a paced, uh, it's a paced environment, a, a kind of a, a paced process so that we can peak on demand and we can rest on demand, we can recover. We were always trying to find those times, or I recognize this when I look back, guys were always finding times to just rest and recover. I remember being on the helicopter flying into missions, right? You're on the helicopter flying into missions and people would think about this. I'm sure someone listening to this is going to think about that and think about a very like high intent energy, intense mm -hmm. environment on that helicopter you're going in, kind of like a football team, like hooping it up before they go on the field. Guys were falling asleep. Guys were napping. Guys were listening to their iPods, you know? Guys were, you know, putting in a dip or whatever, right? Because what we were all doing, we were just saving ourselves. We just, we, we knew when to push, we knew when to calm down. And those environments where, oh, I have a moment, I'm going to take this moment, all right? I'm going to take this moment and just plug in my battery, collect my energy, because I might need to go full out later, right? So I'm not going to waste my energy now with all this, you know, kinetic energy that's useless. So it's a really a, a, an idea of, of very precise energy management, um, which is something, yeah, you, you definitely learn. Because guess what? In Hell Week, if you have to go six days, guess what you're starting to do automatically? <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I remember in Hell Week, you know, you'd if you came in as long as you weren't coming in last in one of the, any of the boat races, if you came in first or second or third or whatever, you had some time, they'd usually say, okay, you can go park your boat there. Pays to be do, a winner. And, and well, yeah. it always pays, yeah. but you can park your boat there and sit there, sit by your boat until people are done, until yeah. everybody's done, right? Well, you know in your mind that people are going to be done within the next like three minutes, okay? But you still run over there, you plop yourself down, and you take two and a half minutes to just sit there and be still. Sometimes you fall asleep, <laughs> you know, yeah. because, because you're like, oh, this is a chance. This is a two minute chance to gain energy. And so I think this is the optimal performance allows us to understand and approach energy management this way. And I think it's the way we, that's the way we play the long game of life. Yeah. And if you think about how that applies to other areas of life, let's say I'm creating a business in the first like week, I go all out, I do all these things, but then after that, I'm burnt out from all those activities and yeah. I don't stay consistent. And now all of a sudden, everything I want to do in this business kind of falls short mm -hmm. because I just did everything up front versus tackling one thing a week that's big and being very steady over yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, it's like you, I mean, you do it. ultra racing and, and, uh, and triathlons and stuff. I mean, I mean, you can ask if you were, if you were sprinting your whole run, I mean, how would oh, you yeah. show up on the bike ride or the swim? I mean, it'd be, it, it's, it's silly. No, no long distance athlete or endurance athlete ever will talk about sprinting all at the whole time. They don't go the whole, the whole uh, time at full hundred percent. They find their areas to, oh, I'm going to, okay, this hill, I'm going to power up and then I'm going to rest on the downhill or whatever it is, you know, yeah. you're, you're doing that in, in terms of that, that specific event. So it, it makes sense for life. Yeah, this uh, the the last ultra I did was in Lake Tahoe, and I was visualizing this because I knew it was going to happen. We were at Squaw Valley; they had the 1960 Olympics there, so it's a pretty tough mountain. Yeah, and I knew as soon as it started, you're just going to be going uphill. And I was like, I cannot. I don't care how much energy is there. I cannot sprint up this hill. Yeah. If I sprint up the hill, I'm done. I got right. 31 more miles, yeah. and we just like I was with a I was with some friends, and we just hiked up the hill. We power hiked it, and then we ran the downhill. And it was great. It was a really good way to yeah. conserve energy. And we were steady the whole time. And and to your, kind of to your point of what, what you, you talk about, and I think anyone who runs a longer race can will face this, but it becomes a shit show at 
at times, you know, like yes. there's so many things that happen. That can go wrong and that do. Yeah. Yeah. We had yeah. a buddy pass out. We had to get medics. We had to like, just keep going. And it was just like this, you know, just, and that's life, yeah, right? You is. can't, you can plan for something, but then all of a sudden you're going to get hit with a punch and you got to yeah. change course. Yeah. <laughs> I was working out with a buddy of mine. He was a trainer, still was a trainer. And, um, he was making me do these sled pushes, right. With the weighted sled pushes, 50 yards or so. And, um, and I was doing them and he was timing me. And I said, what are you timing? And they said, um, well, I'm timing how fast you're completing the exercise, but specifically like how fast or what's your pace when you first push out of the gate, when you explode out of the gate versus what's your pace at the end. And I said, what are you, what are you finding with me? He said, well, for, for you, it's really interesting. You start when, when, when you explode out, right? You start at the very same pace that you keep the whole time. You never change your pace, right? I said, well, what do you do? He said, I usually explode out. So I'm really fast. And then I slow down as I get towards the end. I said, what do you see most team guys do? Because he trained a lot of team guys. He said, most team guys do it like you. And I said, and it's the difference between aerobic versus anaerobic power capacity, right? Anaerobic is explosive strength, which is necessary. Uh, but aerobic is long game stuff. And so, so SEALs always start out aerobic, you know, and plan aerobically, right? With the understanding that so, at some point during the process, you go anaerobic when you need to. But as soon as you don't have to be anaerobic, you go back to aerobic. In some cases, you go, you go, almost sub aerobic so you can actually recover a little bit in those times you can recover that's how you play the long game that's how you play a game where you don't know the ending is when you where you don't know when when the ending's coming yeah yeah um, that makes sense okay so let's talk about grit for a second so courage perseverance adaptability resilience yeah why is grit important gosh i think grit is the most important i don't i don't um i make a deliberate effort not to uh rank the attributes or the categories but it's my favorite. Yeah, yeah, but if but if forced, <laughs> if if forced, I would say that's the most important for life. Um, and it's because it it's what it's what allows us to be the human beings we are. I mean, grit is really our ability to uh, power through challenge, and and probably more specifically these acute challenges, like the short term stuff. Like, can I power through this? Can I get through that? Can I do whatever? Um, but it's and it's and again, grit is not just one thing. Grit is the result of several things combined and kind of catalyzed to form the result that is grit. And so these four attributes are the attributes that make up what eventually becomes grit. Courage being probably the most important, our ability to step into our fear. Right? Again, courage cannot exist without fear. This is neurologically proven um, because we have that that it's it's when that amygdala response comes up and that fear starts to enter into our system that we then make a decision to step into it. That's courage. Um, adaptability, or no, excuse me, I think next is perseverance. Perseverance is the ability to push through, power through, um, a combination of tenacity, um, uh, uh, persistence, and fortitude, okay? Again, tenacity and persistence, not the same thing. Persistence requires patience. Persistence is I'm going to do the same thing over and over because I know it's going to work eventually. This is the stone cutter approach, right? Um, tenacity is I'm going to do something. If it doesn't work, I'm going to try something else. And that's the car mechanic approach, right? I'm going to check the belts. If, that has, if it's not the belts, I'm going to go to the carburetor or whatever, right? Both are, a balance of both is required depending on what problem you're trying to solve, right? Um, so so to be able to balance in between tenacity and perseverance, or excuse me, tenacity and persistence, and then buttress it by fortitude, which is really the mental strength to be able to do that in the first place. All those three combined make up perseverance. And the reason why they're not separated is if you take them and separate them, if you are just persistent, that means you're stubborn, right? And you're not, there's, there, you can be a stone cutter, but there's not right. a lot you're going to be doing. Right. If you're just tenacious, then you're impatient, right? Sometimes things take patience. So, so you just have to combine them to actually get perseverance. So that's perseverance. Um, adaptability, which is pretty self-explanatory. I mean, listen, the, there is nothing in the known universe that doesn't change over time, right? <laughs> nothing, well, look right? at our lives yeah. during COVID. Yes, everything changes over time. Nothing stays the same, right? Which means we can either be the dinosaur or the frog, right? If you are not adaptable, you will be a dinosaur, you will go extinct. So adaptability is essential. Um, and then resilience. Resilience also, uh, you know, again, can you get knocked off baseline and then return to baseline, right? The the elastic effect, because because if you can't do that or the to the, to the extent that that's difficult for you will affect your overall ability to persevere and, and have grit and all that stuff. So those are the four, how it breaks down, really important for all. So when you've met people that's, that score, I, I don't want to say well or high or just mm -hmm. like above average, like in a way that that they would be a good fit to be a SEAL or whatever you're, whatever you're looking for, is there a common background trait that these folks have? Like meaning, 
does growing up with adversity help you over index in certain areas on this scale? I think so, because uh, because I think these attributes can and are developed through experience. But what we have to understand is uh, grit alone is not going to make you a successful human being, right? Yeah, sure, you can be good at powering through challenges, uh, but you need drive attributes actually to get somewhere, yeah. okay? Um, so these start to combine in ways that actually start to define success, which is why they're four, which is why there are five categories, right? Um, you can be gritty all day long. If you have no drive, then you're just going right. to be, you should be powering through stuff every day. I mean, you can grind it out every day and you're like, yeah, I get right. But you're not, you're not, <laughs> yeah. you're not making any progress in the long game. You know, yeah. drive speaks to the long game. Those drive attributes speak to the long game attributes, which are, um, and I know we're hopping over one, but that's um, self-efficacy, uh, open-mindedness, discipline, cunning, and narcissism. And I know there's some counterintuitive ones in there, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, but, cunning was the one that got me because yeah. I reread the definition of cunning just to make make sure I understand. Yeah. And it seems like a pejorative. It does uh, seem like pejorative, and they, and they, and so I struggled with okay, what do I write about? Because there's three that could um, well, open-mindedness is already in there, so open-mindedness is like I'm open to this stuff. But the, but curiosity and cunning were in fact the ones I struggled with because um, because I asked myself, okay, when it comes to drive, overall drive, what what would I think would be the preferred attribute? And the reason why I chose cunning is because while curiosity is good, I mean, and curiosity I could probably define as I'm I'm more proactively um, looking into things, you know, because I like to I like new, strange, exciting things. Okay, cunning speaks to this idea of problem solving. Right? Curiosity doesn't necessarily speak to problem solving. Curiosity is just like I'm. Yeah, I want to try that out. It's cool. I'm going to do that. But cunning is actually a problem-solving attribute. Uh, and so so when used um, positively, cunning is enormously effective because it allows us to think outside the pro- uh, think outside the box to solve problems. Think about problems in a, in a different way. Take take a problem and say, okay, what are the boundaries and boundaries and constraints that are attached to this and are they real or are they assumed? You know, and what happens if I break them? Okay, because those types of questions start to speak to one's level of cunning. Because as soon as you can start asking that and saying, well, okay, first of all, like these three are completely imagined by me. They actually aren't boundaries. They just seem to be, but they're imagined. And then this one is actually a real boundary, but breaking it is not going to have too many bad consequences. So let me try it out, right? That's cunning. You know, can I think about Mm something? So I would say, you know, when it comes to SEALs, I mean, one of the most important attributes in Navy SEALs is cunning. Because again, the special operations community and the SEALs specifically were created to frustrate and agitate the enemy, to do things that other units couldn't or wouldn't or wouldn't even think of doing, you know. And I know the book I give the example of the of the medieval castle, yeah, right? Where the, yeah. you know, the princess is in the tower that's guarded by a, a dragon, and the, the king who wants to save the princess every every evening sends his best knight to go slay the dragon and save the princess. But every single knight he sends gets incinerated by the dragon. Well, the Navy SEAL shows up and says, okay. Sire, what's the what's the mission? He says, save the princess. He says, oh, well, who cares about the dragon? Okay, and then and the seal begins to think about a way to save the princess that avoids the dragon altogether, right? right? That's cunning, right? What are the perceived boundaries? The mission is not slay the dragon, save the princess. Yeah. The mission is, in fact, save the princess, right? So cunning allows us to proactively take out some of those constraints that we think actually exist. And that's why I used it instead of curiosity. And I think it's, once I understood it more, yeah, it makes all the sense of the world. Um, when I first took the attributes test, I didn't understand it as much as when I finished the book. Yes, yes, yeah. And um, the end of the test explains it more. I I can point to all these attributes as cunning was a, something that, an attribute that I used that changed my life yeah. just by thinking out of the box. Mm-hmm. And it was applying for a job as someone else because I, I wasn't able to, at the time, apply because my... Um, employee classification. I was a UAW hourly employee. I couldn't apply for this job because yeah. I wasn't a salary employee and it was the salary posting. So I asked to apply as a as an Asian American engineer. <laughs> and I asked him, I said, can I apply as you? And I applied as this as this person, Willis, and submitted the application. And right in the subject line, I said, I'm not I'm not Willis Chin. I'm Joe. Here's my resume, and I got a call, and I got the job, and it changed my life. It got it in the system. It got it yes. in the system, go, yeah. and okay, yeah, I didn't follow the rules, but the rules weren't designed with me in mind. That's right. Yeah, that's so right. So I had to find another way around, yeah. and I can point to that once I understood it more. I was like, yes, that yeah. is such a key attribute 
for not only my story, but when I see others think out of the box to accomplish things or to go around what's a perceived yeah. blocker, like that is so critical. And it's really, I mean, the, the, the pejorativeness comes in when you start hurting other people, right? So if there was an Asian guy named Willis, <laughs> you yeah. know, maybe that's the guy. But so this is where I give the, the Oscar Schindler example. Oscar Schindler was cunning, but he did it for good, right? Whereas right. Bernie Madoff, also cunning, but he right. did it for bad, right? So, so again, these a lot of these words, they take on a pejorative aura, right? But when used effectively are incredible drivers. Same thing as narcissism. You know, narcissism, of course, a, a bad thing. You know, too much narcissism, and there's actually a disorder. Narcissistic personality disorder, that is a bad thing. But... But narcissism really boiled down is one's desire to stand out, be special, be recognized, right? Well, guess what? Every single human being at some point in their lives wants to stand out, be special, be, be recognized at some point, be adored, right? By someone, whether it's just a spouse or a kid or whatever, you know? So this is a human, it's a human quality. Um, and so narcissism, this desire um, properly managed is the cause of most audacious goals, right? Um, why do you want to be the rock star? Why do you want to be the Navy SEAL? Why do you want to be the, you name it? Um, part of it is because you want to be special. You want to be stand out. You want to do something that, that other people haven't done, right? Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. You just have to manage it, you know, and of course not go over the overboard on the, on the disorder. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I thought the same thing when I read that one. And then you think about, social media, just in general, if you're yeah. on social media, you, there's an element of narcissism because yes. yes. you post something like the dopamine effect of getting a reaction. I don't mm -hmm. care if it's a like or a comment is real. Yes. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's unfortunately, we have to be very careful. The way, the way I talk about narcissism is that we have to understand, first of all, it's, it's, it's ill, right? I mean, there's, um, there are specific things that people with that disorder do. Um, but one of the things that you can really recognize about someone who actually is disordered is to look at the people they surround themselves with. Um, people, narcissists who are disordered surround themselves with sycophants, surround themselves with yes men or yes women. Um, and they keep this, this collection of people very close and tight uh, because they're being held up on a pedestal. And of course that collection of people is very transient because it's hard for someone to be deferential, de deferential to another person for very long, for too long. So, so the transientness is is apparent. And when someone leaves that group, that person is now usually the target of the narcissist. They become person, of, you know, enemy number one. They're targeted by that person because that's it's an affront to that narcissist, right? So the way we manage this for ourselves is we just. Play, pay close attention to the people we surround ourselves with. We, if we surround ourselves with people who we trust, who love us, who tell us when we're wrong, who, who keep us humble, who don't put us at the on the on the pedestal all day long or, or too often, right? That's a good group, you know, um, because they are because they are keeping us honest about ourselves. They're keeping us humble um, while we are. Listen, almost I would guarantee, and I don't know this for a fact. I don't know if you, if it, it would be worthwhile doing the research, but. I guarantee if you look at the the most grounded, famous people out there, whether they be musicians or actors or whatever, the most grounded, famous people out there are those people who've surrounded themselves with yeah. trusted, good, close friends and loved ones who tell them the truth and tell them when they're when they're all effed up and tell them when they're when they're being stupid and 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 don't put them on a pedestal pedestal all the time right i guarantee the most grounded famous people are the people who have those who have those groups whereas the other people the people who don't the people who are surrounded by sycophants theirs are the the true narcissists so it's all about who we surround ourselves with yeah no i think that's that's right on and i think that's why a lot of us myself included i've like you know i have a coach that's just like looks at thing looks at stuff that I say like completely unbiased, <laughs> yeah. you know, cause yeah. I, cause it could go the other way. Like I have, I have a daughter who's very like, she's quick to point out everything I do yes. that's wrong. Yeah. yeah. And then that's and what then kids she, do by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and then she's like, she's like, I'm the only one that tells you how it is. And I'm like, well, I mean, maybe do a point, but, right. but it's, it's, it's important that you have that kind of balance and those people in your yeah. life. And, and like, you know, in my case, it's worth having that external third party to, not have preconceived notions that can look at things. And I think that's that's huge. It is huge. I think it's critical. And it's critical to our well-being too, because because guess what? It feels good to lift another person up too. You know? Yeah. So so if you have a group where you're mutually lifting each other up, then you all get a little dose of narcissism once in a while and get that yeah. nice chemical burst, which it is. You're getting 
you're getting um, oxytocin, you're getting dopamine, you're getting serotonin, those three chemicals when you're getting paid attention to. So we all get those bursts of stuff and we're just doing it for each other. That's the, that's the most healthy group of friends and family. So, Well, since we jumped to drive, uh, let, let's finish that attribute category out. You have discipline, open-mindedness, cunning, which we talked about, and self-efficacy. Yes. Um, self-efficacy, you know, again, a combination of a couple attributes, a combination of um, uh, initiative, uh, well, confidence, I can do this, initiative, I have, I, I'll get going, I'll get moving, and then optimism. But what I, when I talk about optimism, it's a realistic optimism. It's, um, it's an optimism that says, hey, I... I, I am positive this will turn out. I know there will be challenges along the way, so I'm going to prepare as, as much as I can, but I'm I'm optimistic it'll turn out. So it's a combination of those three things, confidence, initiative, and, and optimism, um, which allow us to then pivot. You know, whether or not something's getting thrown at us and it causes us to pivot because we have to react, or whether we deliberately pivot. We say, I'm going to make a change, right? Um, so that's the first one. Uh, open-mindedness, you know, again, kind of self-explanatory. The closed mind is the... is is closed to all possibilities. I mean, it's a stubborn mind. It's a mind that's not letting in new ideas. It's made up. It's learned everything. It's not humble, right? So open-mindedness is, is pretty, uh, is pretty uh, necessary. And again, I separate open-mindedness from ego and arrogance, some, some of those more pejorative things that you might see very successful people enacting. And open-mindedness is really is I'm, I'm passively open to all new ideas, right? That helps with drive. Um, and then discipline, which is interesting because discipline is different than self-discipline. I separate them in the book. Uh, discipline has to do with our ability to achieve, to set, achieve, or set and and um, and walk to, and then achieve long-term goals, right? Um, and the way I separate discipline and self-discipline is that self-discipline are those things that we can do that um, the outside world has zero. Uh, effect on or, or influence on, right? So so you and I could say, well, we're going to run a marathon or we're going to get in shape, right? We're going to eat healthy, okay? And um, and the the outside world has zero influence um, on whether or not we do that. You and I could then go to Vegas, right? And we could go to the buffet. The buffet's not going to throw pastries at us, right? right? It's our decision, you know, right. that's self-discipline, all right? Discipline overall um, is, are those are those goals or those objectives that we have that the outside world does have a say, right? That's the become a musician, become a Navy SEAL, be an author, be, just start a podcast, start a company, right? Outside world is going to have a say in that, which means the outside world is going to throw things at you that you have to then overcome, move through and adapt, okay? And they have the ability, to, the outside world has the ability to affect that goal, right? So, so someone can be very self-disciplined, but not have a lot of discipline. That's the, I call it the kind of the self-disciplined mm. loser, the person who's I mean, self-discipline in every aspect of their lives. Whatever they do, they work out, they eat, whatever, but they can't get their lives, you know, going, right? They can't do, they can't achieve a long-term goal. Uh, someone can be very disciplined in long-term stuff, but they have miserable self-discipline, right? I throw myself in that category sometimes. My self-discipline is very hard for me. Um, I have to work at it, whereas discipline comes pretty easy for me. I can, I can kind of think about those long-term goals, right? So obviously the best balance is to have both, right? The most successful people have are able to live in both areas. They can be somewhat self-disciplined and also actually disciplined. Um, and a measure of that is your, uh, your, I guess you're okay with uh, uh, rigidity and and structure and routine. The self-disciplined person, the highly self-disciplined person loves structure, loves routine, and hates to be broken off of routine and structure, which is, uh, structure, which is why sometimes those long-term goals aren't very easy for them because whenever you go into a long-term goal, you are going to be broken off routine. There are going to be days where you can't eat the right thing. You can't work out. You can't, you're going to be off your game. You're not going to get enough sleep, right? There's going to be things that happen that throw you off routine um, versus, you know, the, you know, someone who might not be very self-disciplined, but really good on discipline is okay with things getting thrown out of, out of whack. Hey, I'm just going to move through it, you know, but, you know, I don't have a lot of rigidity and structure. So, so the balance is to, 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 to have some rigidity and structure to help you be self-disciplined in those things you need, um, but then be loose. You know, be loose in the. You, you can break it once in a while because the world's gonna gonna make you break it. Can you succeed if you over-index on one or one or another of those? Meaning, like you said, you struggle with self-discipline, but discipline you were you were good with. Is there a point where self-discipline becomes so low? that 
or is there a warning sign that you're not going to achieve what you yes. want to achieve? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think I think um, yeah, I think I think the in overall discipline in the conduct of any goal, it's the the the, the pathway is going to throw at you requirements that you must then fulfill, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes the requirements is to be self-disciplined. <laughs> you know, yeah. I had to be self-disciplined to get in shape for SEAL training, right? Um, otherwise, when I got to SEAL training, regardless of whether or not there's, a, there's, I say it's not about the physical fitness. There's a much. baseline. There's a baseline. Yeah. You need to, you need to, yeah. you need to have yeah. some sort of baseline, or else you're, you're going to die in the first three minutes, right? So, um, so there's a baseline you have to have. So I think, I think yes, the there has to be a balance. You know, I joke about being, not being as I, I would say I'm not as self disciplined as I am disciplined. I'm higher on overall discipline than I am self disciplined. Do I have self discipline? Of course I do, because you need it. You know, overall discipline is going to require self discipline. Um, I think. I think self-discipline, I don't know, I have met people who are literally, they can't get anything going in their lives, right, long-term, but they are incredibly self-disciplined, right? So I don't know, but I, I'd, have to, I'd have to kind of do a little bit more diligence on yeah. how that, how that mapped, up, mapped out. But, um, but yeah, they do play off of each other. Certainly. Is there any people when you were leading um, the, the special ops team in the SEALs that were performing well and you just scratched your head because they weren't as high as they maybe should have been or you thought they were on these attribute scales? I don't think I ever thought about it that way because, again, I think the SEAL community and SEAL training, it deselects anybody who doesn't have the attributes you need. You right. um, I would say when I was – and you and I kind of had a, a some of this conversation before we were on yeah. uh, on, the, on, on the on record here. But, you know, when I was running that uh, specialized training – that was probably when I started to think more about how the dis- some of the distinctions between what I needed to see for the specialized command versus a regular, uh, just a, you know, a, a regular SEAL, right? And I say regular SEAL, it even sounds, you know, a um, little bit, you know, pejorative, but I don't mean it that way. Just someone who's, you know, who, who didn't have what, it, who didn't have the attributes for this specific command. So there's some differences there, but overall, um, if you're making it through BUDS, you have... The attributes you need. <laughs> Got it. Well, I mean, I, I think that is different than life, right? Because life, yeah. you see people that could be perceived as successful, and you're and not in a pre- pejorative way either. But like, you can scratch your head and be like, "Wow, how did they get so successful?" Because they lack maybe self discipline or yeah. discipline or one of these attributes. Well, we, well, we've seen we've seen c- cases of famous people who are enormously successful, and their lack of self discipline. Do, does them in? I mean, and they they maybe die young or or get yeah. or, th- or th- get thrown off the That's rails or sabotage themselves, right? Somehow, so we've seen it, you know, play out many times. So I think, um, I think, yeah. But again, th- this is where awareness is key. If you know this about yourself, you are, I think, ten times more likely to, you know, stem it or take care of it when it needs to be taken care of, you know, because because the knowledge is there. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think that I mean the whole point of this is to identify the strength and weaknesses in your attributes and then especially if you're building a team Mm -hmm. to fill those like a great example is you and your wife that you talk about in your in your book at all like she has she has certain strengths and you have certain strengths um and some of the things she's good at you're not and vice versa i think that's that's true in in a lot of marriages and a lot of relationships certainly in in my company and i've evolved as a leader over time Initially, I wanted to be good at everything. And then I realized, like, I don't really like doing this. And right. if I don't like it, I'm generally not good at it. Yes. <laughs> and it's yes. because I'm not good at it, I don't generally like it. So those things, and if I don't necessarily want to take the time to improve in a said category, then I would find someone else that's good at it and that likes it. That's what team That's what team building is about. So first, first thing a team has to understand is that there's going to be a, a unique set of attributes that's required for that team. And with, but what I mean by that is the attributes required to... The, the attributes required to be a Navy SEAL on a SEAL team is going to look different than the attributes required to be on an accounting team or on a marketing team or whatever. Okay, so every team has its list of attributes that say, okay, these are the attributes that overall. The perfect candidate, right, has all of these. Well, unless you go to another planet somewhere, you're never going to find the perfect candidate, right? So, so teams actually are a zipper between attributes that complements each other, right? You, not Not every person needs to have every attribute on a team. You just need to zipper those attributes so that if someone, if a team requires someone who is competitive, right, and also requires someone who is adaptable, whatever it is, 
And you don't have a candidate that has both, then you have someone who's competitive, you have someone who's adaptable. But then the team understands when com- when competitiveness needs to take, you know, take a, a, a predominant position, then that person steps to the forefront. Whereas when adaptability needs to step up, then that person steps to, to a forefront. So, so a team would behoove itself to understand, A, which attributes they need for a team. This is some of the work we do with companies and organizations in our consulting. What do you need for this team? What do you need? Uh, what, what are the requirements? And then how do all the team members stack up in terms of what they contribute? And that tells us, okay, here's where everybody can position themselves so that they're best, the most effective. Because someone might be underperforming because they're not, like you said, in the right position that's that's kind of capitalizing on their attributes. So you, you learn that about your team, but then you also understand the gaps. Now I know exactly what I need to hire for. And I can actually hire for specific attributes and then I can, as long as they have that, I can train whatever skill I want to train as long as they have the attributes I'm looking for. Yeah, right on. So mental acuity, uh, that ca- that category, yeah. let's dive in there. So mental acuity is really how our brain processes the world, okay? Um, and so there, there's four. There's situation awareness, how, how much information are we actually paying attention to, our vigilance, okay? Uh, some people who are, people who are high on situational awareness notice a lot of things, okay? A lower situation where people don't notice a lot of things, you know. Um, so that's situation awareness. And then once that information is, it, you know, we get that information, we're processing it through compartmentalization. We're, we're based on the task we're trying, we're trying to conduct. We're immediately assessing the relevance of all the information coming in. Then we're prioritizing what makes sense in this moment. And then we're focusing on what we need to focus on. And then we're need, then we then once we fo- when we're, once we're done focusing, we switch to the next thing, which then we get into task switching, which is the next one. How effectively can we switch in between categories and contexts, which is not multitasking? We all know multitasking is a myth, right? We don't we can't really our conscious minds really can't focus on more than one thing at a time. Now, neuroscientists, my buddy Heberman will tell you that you can technically the brain can technically focus on two things, kind of, but. But for the for the layman's <laughs> consideration, I was I was going to ask a question yeah. on that for a second. So I I wholeheartedly agree that not being focused on one thing is usually a detriment. However, what I found beneficial is when you do a mundane task, right? Like, let's call it you're uh, doing the dishes yes, or you're yeah. doing a chore or even driving and listening to an audio book or right. listening to a podcast. Right. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it doesn't count when you've relegated that activity to the unconscious mind, right? You can do that right. because you okay. can drive without thinking about it. I guarantee you though, if you're driving, listening to a podcast and someone swerves in front of you and you have to perform evasive maneuvers, right? You'll have to rewind the last 15 seconds of your podcast. For sure. Because your, your brain had to switch, right? Yeah. So, so yes, we can we can have a, we can hold a, a, a very limited kind of light attention to something that our conscious, our unconscious mind is mostly doing um, while we're paying attention to something more focused. Um, but as soon as, as soon as intensity happens, as soon as that thing breaks into that, where we have to deeply focus, you know, we will drop a dish or we'll do whatever we, you know, it's, right, something yeah. will happen that focuses in. So, so task switching is just our ability to kind of switch in between those inside of deep focus, right? This is the person who can, the person who's high on task switching can go from a, typing an email immediately to a phone call, immediately to a conversation right. and be like seamless, right? Their brain just switches. Whereas some of us are like, shit, I gotta, you yeah. know, my brain, yeah. I can't, I, I, I think to take a moment before I before I swap, swap. And then learnability, which is the last one, which is our ability to kind of effectively absorb and metabolize all of those lessons. How fast, how, how fast can we pick up information and learn it and absorb it, right? The people who are high on learnability are those people that we might know who you tell them something once and they have it, like they pick it up right away. You know, whereas I, I was telling you, I was joking, I'm a little bit lower on learnability. It takes me a while to learn I'm something. I'm the same way. Yeah, I, have to, I, make the, <laughs> I make the same mistake a couple of times before I actually learn, right? So, but then we have, you know, people we know and there were guys in SEAL training. In certain parts of SEAL training, I'd have to like stay behind and like really like absorb it. Where other guys yeah. would go out drinking at the end because they got it once the, the first time every time, right? They I'm were jealous of those good. people. Yeah, it's it's fast. So I got to tell you a quick funny story. So I I was um, I entered a dance competition called Dancing with the Stars. It was a local thing, yeah. not, not the national one. And I am not a good dancer, but I'm like, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to I'm going to win this thing. Yeah. It took me 80 lessons. Like most most people, let me set this up. You get eight lessons for free. Most people take eight lessons. I took 80. 80, yeah. Eight zero. I was going like at some points toward the end, like twice a day. So it took my brain so much longer. Yeah. But I wasn't going to quit. So I knew I had to make that up in some way. And I was like the only way to make that up. And unfortunately, it cost me time and money. Right. But I ended up 
luckily winning just because I memorized the whole thing and I took 10x more lessons than yeah. everyone else. But it was it was just a it's just a testament to I oh my I the people that can get things quickly. It's a nice oh, it's, it's a nice attribute to have. It's got to be so amazing because yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never had that in my yeah. life. But again, knowing it is is half the battle. Right. You knew, hey, I need to I'm going to have to put more effort into this, right? It's just something I have to do. Love it or, or not. Right. I just have to do it. Um, it just gets wearing when like anything you want to learn new, you're like, damn it, I got to spend so much oh, more time. I, I used to get so frustrated. And there were times in, in, in SEAL training where we'd be learning something and I would just be just downright pissed because yeah. it would be taking me so long. I'd be making the same mistakes and be like, what the hell is wrong with this? You know, <laughs> but you know, you just have to knuckle down and, and learn it and do it. Do it, just do more, right? It's yeah. just, you, again, there's no judgment on how these attributes fall in terms of how we show up. It's just knowledge. It's like be like judging our hair color. It's just the way it is, you know. And if I have to develop it, okay, I'll just yeah. develop it. So. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So I mean, it's it's obvious for you to have commanded that elite uh, team in the seals. Uh, you, you obviously were doing a lot of things right. So yeah, well, like, think, even if it took I, you a long yeah. time, it didn't. And I think I, I was able to, well, inadvertently because I wasn't really thinking about it, but capitalize on those attributes that yeah. I had. A lot of again, I was an officer, so that actually a good segue into the leadership attributes. Right? Yeah, Cause, yeah. Because when you talk about leadership, you know, I was an officer, so I was always in charge of something. You know, um, and leadership is one of those things that people conflate with being in charge. Leadership, leader, being a leader and being in charge are two different things, right? One is a verb and one is a noun. Okay, um, being a leader is uh, is not something you can self designate. You can't you can't sit there and say I am a leader. Okay, that's like saying you're good looking or funny. Um, other people decide whether or not you are someone they want to follow. And they, de they decide whether or not you are a leader. You can be in charge all day long. Someone can put you in charge. You can have a position. You can be paid to be in charge, right? Whether or not you're a leader is decided by someone else and it's done based on behaviors, the way you behave. And these behaviors stem from these core attributes. Those attributes that I talk about are empathy, um, uh, accountability, decisiveness, um, authenticity, and... There's the fifth one, um, selflessness are the, are the five. Those five behaviors are what allow others to say, this is someone I want to follow, right? And um, and again, we, we've done this. I did this work when I got out of the Navy. I was working with, well, my buddy, Simon Sinek, who's, you know, a mm -hmm. known author. I was working with his his crew for, for well, I still do. But I was uh, working a lot with a group called the, well, then Barry Wimler Leadership Institute, now the Chapman & Co., Leadership Institute, Institute, wonderful group out of St. Louis, and they um, uh, they were uh, we were teaching leadership. We were going around the country, around the world. One of the things we'd always do with all of the audiences is usually at the beginning of our sessions, which were sometimes two days long, we'd say uh, we'd get a whiteboard up there and say, "Hey, what do great leaders do?" We just ask the question of the audience. And then we just have them yell out answers and we just write them up, write these words up. And we'd usually fill this this list of like 20, 30 things. Well, on every single, first of all, every list was the same. <laughs> yeah. people, people said the same stuff, right? Every Apathy, single list listen, had all of these yeah. attributes, every one, right? Um, these five always showed up every single time, right? So, so we know what great leaders, we know what we look for in great leaders, and these are the behaviors that we look for. Empathy can, when I hear that word personally, there's some things that I am clearly empathetic for, but other things, just given my past history of, and I think I've, I see others exhibit similar behavior. You um, can somehow not have as much empathy in certain areas, especially when I think about business, right? Yeah. And and things that may over may seem silly or overtly um, non important. Yeah. Um, yet some people will grab onto them and make them very important. How can a leader have more empathy for situations they? cannot understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a great question. Well, first thing leaders have to understand is that every single organization is made up of one common element, and that is people. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's, it's all about people, right? So the way you deal with people, the way you interact and handle people matters. And if you do it wrong, your organization is not going to do very well. Part of showing people that you care about them and having people feel like you care about them is to be empathetic. And empathetic is not it's not it's different from sympathy. Sympathy is I know how you feel, right? Um, uh, sympathy is I've uh, like I I've, I see someone I never smoked, but look at this example. I see someone smoking or trying to quit smoking, and I've tried to quit smoking, so I I know how they feel, right? Um, versus empathy, which is I feel how you feel. I can actually I can actually get into your being at least to the extent where I can actually understand and feel what you're feeling. 
um, that's a whole different uh, element. And that's when you really start to understand people and people feel like they're understood on levels that are well beyond just, hey, how you doing? And my boss cares about me, right? Um, it's it's It takes some effort because, well, first of all, it shouldn't because we're actually wired to be empathetic. Humans are wired to, to do that. Um, I mean, people, you, you know, you go to a nursery and you hear one baby start crying and wonder why all the other babies start to cry, cry because it's not because we're, they're all hurt, right? We, we're wired to have to kind of have this empathy. Plus, we learn lessons. We can learn lessons peripherally by being by by our empathy, you know, because we can we like we see someone you know get burned by fire. Man, we can actually. That's not just like oh, I know oh, how yeah. they feel. It's like oh, I feel. I do not want to feel that way, right? So there's an empathy there. So so we're wired to do it, but our frontal lobe gets in the way. Our top, it's called top-down control. Um, and so our conscious mind gets in, in the way oftentimes of our limbic, which is our emotionally wired brain or the brain, the part of our brain our emotions come from. Um, and so it takes a proactivity. It, it, takes a, it takes an effort to say, okay, let me proactively start to think about how this person might feel. So an example I give, I gave this recently on a podcast I did, but um, we were overseas, and uh, and at one, you know, unfortunately, overseas, whether you're in Iraq and Afghanistan, mostly in Iraq, but you'd sometimes see these, um, like these 15 year old kids, like they try to shoot a rocket propelled grenade at a at a U.S. or Allied convoy or whatever, and, all, and and most of the time it didn't go very well for them. They were addressed by the by the coalition because you know, again, you can't let that happen. But it was always unfortunate to see. Right. And I remember us seeing a group of us seeing this, and a bunch of us seals, right? And we we saw this. And we, it, it sparked a conversation between us and we said, hmm, let's just, let's just think about this for a second. Okay. This is that kid, this 15 year old kid. He's in a country. Okay. That's war torn. All right. There's no school to go to. He's probably, he's, he probably doesn't have a father. His father's probably gone. So it's just him taking care of his mom and his, his siblings. Right. Um, there's no sports to play. There's no parties to go to. There's no girls to chase. There's nothing in that 15 year old's life to, release that testosterone that's boiling in all of us when we're that age, right? Nothing, you know? Well, one day these guys come to the house and say, hey, we'll give you 100 dinar if you go shoot this rocket at that convoy. And every single one of us to a man said that we would be that kid, mm -hmm. right? We would have all been that kid because of course we would have done it, right? What else is there to do? I mean, that's exciting. It's a, a chance to help, a chance to do something. This is a this is a way, now, keep in mind, we didn't agree with the act, right? And this is a good lesson. We don't have to agree with another person to empathize with another person, right? That is very, very important. I think we have to recognize that and remember that, especially in our nation today, because we're at a point where we're being torn apart, it feels like. You know? And part of it is because we refuse to empathize because we think empathy involves agreement. Well, I don't need to agree with you for me to start empathizing with you. And so empathy is a proactive thing where you you take the time and take some deliberateness in saying, okay, let me put my let me let me take a moment and put myself in that person's shoes. Understanding I don't have to agree with it. Let me just put that my per, myself in that person's shoes. That's what we need to do. And as leaders, it's funny because as leaders, a lot of times leaders have come up through the ranks, mm -hmm. right? So they actually don't know that they actually have empathy built in because they've been down there before. <laughs> you know, all they have to do is that you know this when we have kids. I mean, you can relate to this. I have teen, my kids are teenagers right now. Sometimes my teenager. This is, right? They act in a way. I'm like, what the hell are they thinking right now? And then I have to right. say, like, wait a second. What was I thinking when I was at that age? Right. Right. I, Cause I was at age once too. I mean, that's just me placing myself back in that position. Right. And trying to get back in there a little bit tough. Cause it seems like a long time ago, but that's what empathy is. It's a, it's a proactive thing and it takes effort. I, I love that explanation and that story that just puts things into a completely different context. Yeah. Uh, team ability is the last category that uh, you touch on in the book, and that's integrity, conscientiousness, uh, humility, and humor. Yeah. Let's yeah. start at the end there, because humor is the, the one that, <laughs> it, it, it is, it truly is. And, and it's it's funny how humor is so important and how it can just relieve stress immediately. Yes. And, uh, and I love how you pay kudos to comedians and people that take you to other places to smile and laugh. But I, I love that you had that in your book. Yeah. And uh, yeah, let's start there. We'll start there because it is one of the most important. So uh, in, in SEAL training, you do something called surf torture. Um, and this is an evolution where you line up in Southern California along the surf zone. You link arms with your, with your classmates. And then you walk out. You march out into the surf zone until it's about knee high. And then you turn around and you lay back. And so you're laying in there and the, the waves are crashing over you and then receding and then crashing over and receding. It's the coldest thing you've ever 
experiencing your life because the, because the waves are cold and the wind hits you. I mean, it's just you get most people quitting during during surf. And program. you did it in November too. Yeah, and I was so doing it in summer, like but, but it, again, summer. people people don't understand that Southern California water is cold pretty much year, all year <laughs> right. long, right? So so, but November it is pretty <laughs> pretty darn cold, right? But anyway, um, inevitably when you're doing surf torture, at some point an instructor is going to drive a van up to the beach just like they did with our class and get out of that van with a with a megaphone and say to the effect um hey i have hot chocolate and blankets and donuts for anybody who quits right now okay kind of like that survivor thing mm -hmm. and um and we get a lot of people quitting you know because it's like you know of course like, then now i'm i'm you, you've broken me okay i remember them doing that for us and the guy next to me to my right immediately yells back hey do you have any chocolate plays donuts because if you don't i'm not quitting and I immediately burst out laughing, and he laughs. And I remember thinking, "Oh, I'm gonna be, this is this is fine. I'm gonna be okay." I looked to my left though, and the guy on my left, he's stone faced, didn't even hear the joke, right? And I said to myself, "This this guy's not gonna make it." <laughs> sure enough, within a minute, he quits. Right? The reason why that happens is because laughter is really interesting. Laughter, when we laugh, first of all, it's involuntary. It's like sneezing. Okay, we don't control it when we truly laugh. When we do, we're burst with three very powerful chemicals: two neurotransmitters and one. Um, hormone neurotransmitter dopamine which we all know about dopamine is the feel-good chemical one of the most powerful chemicals that we produce and it just tells us keep doing this this is good it's also the root of all addictive behavior addictive behavior creates dopamine which is why we continue want to do it okay so we get dopamine we get endorphins which any endurance athlete will know that's runner's high that's something I we're designed as endurance creatures as humans so our body created its own natural opiates to mask pain mask physical pain that's what endorphins are they mask our physical pain designed as human beings or designed by nature for us as human beings to go the long haul to go, to endure right so we get endorphins and then we get oxytocin which is a hormone not a neurotransmitter but it still works fairly quickly um and it's known as the love hormone okay it, it binds us it bonds us together you know when when we when you hug someone or embrace someone there's an exchange of oxytocin when you shake hands when you do something kind for another human being there's oxytocin even when you witness a kind generous act you get burst with oxytocin which is why we love videos of kind acts we should have more of those on the news to be honest with you we all feel feel better because we all get burst with this stuff anyway you get oxytocin so you get all three of those chemicals when you laugh you get all three of them so what happens in the surf zone right i'm freezing in the surf zone i'm miserable when my buddy makes the joke right i laugh immediately i get jol jolted with dopamine this is okay keep doing this right i get endorphins this doesn't feel that bad and then i get oxytocin we're in this together you know, mm. um, it is a huge, huge hack for courage, for grit, for everything, because we're getting a hack of natural, powerful chemicals that keep us going. So I kind of talk about honoring that class clown. First of all, you don't have to be the class clown to, to have humor. You just have to be able to laugh. Um, but if you have class clowns in your team, you have to keep them around. They are extremely valuable, <laughs> extremely valuable in situations because they are the ones who are going to make, to make you laugh and making you laugh is going to keep you going. I mean, listen, cancer survivors talk about this all the time. There's so many stories of cancer survivors saying, hey, when I was going through all that chemo stuff, I just decided I was going you know, to watch funny stuff as much as I could. I was going to laugh as much as possible. It works. I mean, laughter is quite literally one of the best medicines. Um, and it's because it's a natural, uh, natural high that we're getting. How do you evoke humor when you're either alone or with someone that isn't funny and you're going through something really hard to yeah. try and tap into that? It's a great question. I mean, the best thing to do is just train yourself to try to find the funny. <laughs> I mean, really, this <laughs> yeah. is what I say. You know, you didn't ask me before we started, do I miss the teams? And, and the answer is no, because you age out of that stuff. And, you know, you know, at this point, I, you know. I'd be like a captain or something. So I really wouldn't be doing team guy stuff anymore. Um, and I think missing, um, the word missing invokes a longing and I don't long, but I do look fondly back on those memories. And the ones I look back most fondly on are those times we were just in the most miserable situations and we were laughing until we were crying because someone said something that was so stupid or funny <laughs> and we just die laughing. And so it's, it's almost a habit that you create in the SEAL teams. This is why, listen, comedians, like I say, I mean, comedians are, so important to this world they really are i mean they can keep us going um and and uh and we have to honor them i mean they should be the true rock star i mean some of them are right but, but i yeah. mean they are they do so much for us as human beings and they don't just do it because they quote entertain us they they juice us with chemicals because they make us laugh so so yeah any high performing team that you're on you need to make sure humor is a part even if it's just a marriage my wife and i do this all the time and we I mean, there are certain times where we're just miserable and it's hard to laugh. But 
most of the time we can be laughing within a few minutes <laughs> yeah. of something yeah. bad happening. And, and we, we consider that, we're grateful for that. We consider that as a kind of a superpower. Yeah, it's funny because some, sometimes I find myself, and, and I don't doom scroll a lot or I don't scroll a ton on social media, but on YouTube, sometimes I watch like the silliest yeah. things and I just start cracking up yeah. my wife. Some some of them she doesn't find funny. Like for some reason I love like Steven Seagal like <laughs> videos, yeah, yeah. At, and people talking about him like his martial arts and it's just and it, I just find it super humorous and I'll have it and and now I feel a little bit better about doing that because after those I'm just like dying laughing and feel great and usually I'm always like reading something to for self improvement or better men right, how to right. be a better father businessman whatever. But, um, and th those are all important. I don't want oh, to dismiss no, that yeah, at but, all, but, but like it, you need it. I mean, whenever I'm usually on the YouTube train, <laughs> right. My algorithm usually takes me to Norm Macdonald and I'm watching Norm yeah. Macdonald videos. I mean, my algorithm He's is so pretty funny. simple. It's going to go yeah. to, it's going to eventually take me to, to, to probably exactly. Norm or something, something funny. Right. And I do the other, the other diligence on good research, but, uh, but yeah, if, you know, find some things to laugh at. I mean, imagine if we as a nation could laugh more as well. I mean, we're just everything's so serious, you know, yeah. and, um, yep. that's bad. <laughs> that really is bad. I mean, so, you know, yeah, no, I, I think that's right on. And I was happy to read that and know that we just have to all take the time out of our lives to find something that we find funny. Yeah. This is very personal yeah. too. And if you are a class clown and you can make others laugh, yeah. recognize that. Doing it. Keep doing it. So then there's humility, uh, conscientiousness and integrity. So, um, okay, first integrity, okay, do the right thing, okay, but the, th the thing, the trick about that we have to understand is do the right thing is subjective. <clears throat> um, do the right thing means something different for a SEAL platoon than it might mean for a Cub Scout troop, than it might mean for an ISIS group, right? I mean, so so do the right thing is not necessarily what we bring to it. Do the right thing on a team in, your, in, in, in the context of being able to operate with other human beings is to figure out what do the right thing means for the team. Or leaders and organizations have to, have to, have to explicitly define what do the right thing is. You know, what does integrity mean for that company? This is where company values and things like that can come from. But if you're not explicit about what do the right thing is, you know, the group is going to sort it out in whatever way they want, sometimes not the best way. So that's integrity. Um, conscientiousness is pretty, is pretty simple. It's the combination of um, being diligent, being uh, reliable, and working hard. Those three things, okay? Um, the diligence to do the job with focus and 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 um, and uh, care, uh, reliably uh, show up and and be reliable to someone else. That's consistency. It builds trust. And then hard work. I mean, listen, you know, if someone's a hard worker, we t tend to respect that on a team. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's a, that's an easy one. All right. And then um, and then humility. I think humility again, fairly self-explanatory. It's not this idea that that you have to be timid. Um, it's this idea that you show up and you're always willing to learn. You're always willing to seed. Uh, to someone else who knows more. You're always willing to learn from someone else. But this is what leaders need to do too. And leaders don't understand that, that one of the most powerful thing, things that you can say as a leader to the people on your team, the people in your span of care is, I need you, right? Uh, because I can't do it without you, you know? And really mean it, right? Because most leaders sh should mean it because they can't do anything without, you know? But this idea that I need you, I mean, again, in a SEAL platoon, um, it's so that's so apparent. I mean, as, a, as the officer in charge, I don't know even a tenth of what the sniper knows. I need him to do his job. I don't know a tenth of what the breacher knows. I need him to do his job. So there's just a mutual respect and a give and take. They don't know a tenth of what I need to do in terms of managing a target or, or, or working different assets or even you know briefing briefing things, right? Whatever that is. But, um, but that's really where teams begin to hum is when we can enter in a team with this idea that I am humble enough to um, to yes, lead when it's when it's my turn, when it's necessary for me to lead. But then, as soon as it's not, I step back and I follow. I can follow as easily as I can lead, and I'm willing to do any one of those things. So that's humility. Yeah, I think that's so critical in your book too that you talked about dynamic leadership. Yeah, and the ability to flow in and out of that position. And the example that that you give is. Um, it's a pilot. Yeah. You know, that's one of yeah. the examples. Yeah. The, so dynamic subordination is what I talk about. And it's the idea that um, every high performing team understands that, that problems and challenges and, and issues can come from any angle at any moment. And when one does, the person who is the closest to the problem and the most capable immediately steps up and takes charge. Right. And then everybody follows. And then something ha different happens. Someone else takes charge. Everybody follows. It's a, I also call it alpha swapping. It's a dynamic swap between leader 
and follower. And so in the in the airline example I give is, you know, you can, you know, no one would argue that the captain of a of an airplane, of an airliner, is in charge. I mean, that's that's everybody knows that, right? However, that that captain could be taxing out to takeoff, and the maintenance guy calls and says, "Hey, I found a problem. You need to turn around." Well, no captain worth their wings is going to ignore that. You know, they're gonna they're gonna defer, default, subordinate to that maintenance guy and turn that plane around. And then they get to the gate and they realize they have to um, deplane. Right? Well, the captain doesn't take charge of that either. The flight attendant steps up and takes charge of that. Right? So that's a dynamic subordination environment. It's that alpha swap. You know, I joke about it with my wife and I because you know a great a great marriage is a high performing team. And you know, we always hated the whole thing. Well, who wears the pants in the family? I can't, mm-hmm. I can't stand that because, because the answer is like, well, whoever has to in the moment, whatever pants mean. I mean, it's right, so stupid, right. But, but I was like, listen, if 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 some if patience is required, right? She's impatient. I'm patient, quite naturally, right? If patience is required, I immediately step up and I take lead, and she follows, right? If impatience is required, she typically steps up and takes lead, right? So we, so we're constantly in this ebb and flow of who's in charge, and so so the answer to who's who has the pants? I mean, we both do. I mean, no one has. We're passing the pants, right? right? Which can be a fun thing for a relationship, probably. <laughs> so, I mean, it's but that's how high performing teams operate. So, yeah, no, I think that's right on. And I, I know the other example is like when SEALs have to clear rooms, like there's not a leader that's standing in the front saying, okay, now, now right. you go. Everyone's kind of dynamically yeah. in charge at that moment. Yeah, you could be, you could go into a room and say you have a four man entry, right? So, you could be the number four guy into that room. And then in, in a couple seconds, that room's clear. And because the next threat is closest to you, now you're the leader, right? And you're mm-hmm. going through number one. You know, so it's constantly that that was one of these environments where you could see this playing out so so visibly, right? When you're watching close quarter combat, just because the the leadership swaps all the yeah. time. It's like you're never in the same place twice. That's why also the act of doing it is so complex, and why you, you need a a certain level of attributes to be able to do it effectively, because it's just so much fast moving dynamic stuff. So now that we cover the the attributes, how does a person listening to these take these attributes? They they've taken the assessment maybe online, which I highly recommend on theattributes.com. You could take the assessment. How do you apply these to your life? And uh, what have you heard from people that have? Yes. Well, the, the the biggest way to apply them is it helps you understand your own engine, so to speak. So I often describe humans as automobiles, right? Some of us are Ferraris, some of us are Jeeps, some of us are SUVs, right? And there's no judgment, right? Because the the Ferrari can do things the Jeep can can't do, and the Jeep can do things the Ferrari can't do. So, um, whatever you are, that's fine. the 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 power is to lift your hood up and figure out what engine you are, because you may in fact be a Jeep that's been trying to run on a Ferrari track, or a Ferrari that's been trying to run on a Jeep track. So, so that knowledge alone can allow you to do one of two things. It can allow you to say, you know what? This is why I'm not as happy as I should be. I'm going to go find a Jeep track I can run on. Or it may allow you to say, actually, I am a Jeep and I'm running a Ferrari track. I now know what I need to do to improve my performance on the Ferrari track. Because I want to stay on the Ferrari track, but I now I know what I need to do. So so understanding where we fall in the attributes can, can um, illuminate why we behave the way we do, especially elemental behavior, why we behave the way we do in challenge, uncertainty, and stress. That alone can help someone do better, right? Um, but also when you understand what engine you are, um, again, there's there's tens of thousands of tips, tricks, and techniques to improve yourself, right? To, for, for your performance to improve. Um, the, the, the trick is not everyone works for every person, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? So, so understanding your engine will allow you to start understanding which ones work for you because the nitrous oxide pack might not be the best thing to put on your Jeep engine, right? So so now I can say, okay, now that I'm this engine, now I know where I, how I'm built. Now I know exactly what I can use in this sea of things to actually help me improve in my performance inside of the the, the goal or a niche that I that I want to improve. Dive in deep, a little bit deeper into improvement. So say that we both score a little bit lower on learnability. Yeah. And we want to improve there is the best way to to improve there just by trying new things and doing new things and putting yourself into that atmosphere where you're forced to work on learnability. Yeah, I mean, and so so each attribute has a few different distinctions in terms of what to do. What are some tips, tricks, and techniques you can do to to develop that specific attribute? So I, I, on the on the website, there are some workbooks that that go through the, at least the three categories. Um, and and break down each attribute to give you tips on each attribute that you might want to improve. Ultimately, um, if I were to kind of broad brush the whole thing, it's you're going to have to find ways to put yourself into positions that test 
and tease that attribute. Yeah. So if it's learnability, then okay, I'm gonna. I mean, it's like you, you know, you know, doing the dancing thing. That was testing and teasing your learnability and developing. Now, here's the thing: we may find that it, it's hard to move that needle, right? Learnability might just be something that's hard for us, no matter how many times we do it. Okay, fine. Now I know that. Okay, so now I know if I'm going in and I have to learn something, I just know what it's going to take, right? Um, but you do it. You do it long enough. I would imagine if you and I said, "Okay, we're going to improve our learnability," you and I could probably embark upon a path that allowed us that that saw us throwing ourselves into environments where we had to learn, and then developing some shortcuts, some some tools, so that we could help develop our learnability. I think that's the that's the repetitive part of that, right? If you can if you can do that for and you can do that for any attribute, whether it's adaptability, learnability, resilience, whether it's self efficacy, whether it's um, open mindedness. It's about executing that, and it, and and the thing is, it typically has to be a conscious act, right? Because because unconsciously we're going to default <clears throat> to those attributes that we're stronger right, in, right? Right. Um, so it has to be something you think about um, and consciously do. Okay, now is the time I have to develop my patience, right? You have to say that. I mean, it's almost like you're like, okay, I'm seeing it. I'm seeing. I'm in traffic right now, and I have to practice my patience. I have to develop that. Okay. And again, it gets a little tricky too because. Context matters, right? You, you and I can be inherently impatient people and develop a huge amount of patience with our children, but when it comes to other people's kids, right, right, right. <laughs> we're not as good, right? So, yeah. so context matters as well. So, I think it's it it behooves someone to understand where they're where they want to go. What what is my goal here? And in the conduct of that goal, what are the attributes that I have plenty of that are cool that'll help me? What are the one or two things that if I work on It'll help me, okay? And narrow it down that way. And then at least you're doing it in the proper context towards an objective. I think that's the way to do it. Have you received feedback from people that have worked on just that and improved their uh, their attributes or things that they found they were weak on that they wanted to, to get stronger at? I haven't yet. I mean, again, the book, it's only, a newer came book. Out, yeah, yeah. The book only came out in January. I've definitely received great uh, notes and lovely notes from people saying that they They've really learned a lot about themselves, and it's yeah. it's helping them change the way they view their own performance, and helping them change what they're doing, which is which is the first step, right? Um, and that's cool. I think um, I think like I told you before, we were talking before. I never wanted to write a Navy SEAL book, right? That's I have no interest in doing that. I wanted to write a book that was really for the reader, um, based on some things I learned while I was in the in the SEAL teams, because I thought it was it's a fairly unique experience, you know, and so. And so the feedback I'm getting um, is is generally that where people are like, "Hey, this really helped me figure out myself, um, or figure out my team, or figure out what we need to do in our business." Right? That's that's really cool for me. So there there was something I read about Mind Gym. Ed. Was, yeah, is that correlated to this? Well, is this it was, part of that. It or? was it was correlated only in the sense that at the, it was at the same time that I was doing the attributes work that we were also creating this Mind Gym, and again. So for me, it's always about the mental game, you know, because everything starts in the mind. I mean, we have nothing if we don't have our brains. I mean, all this physical stuff can go out the window if we don't have our brains that control it first, right? And so and so, one of the things that we were looking at was, and we're interested in, was, was better overall performance, human performance. So there's the selection and assessment piece, which involved attributes. But then there was a human performance piece. Was like, okay, how do we actually do better performance-wise? Well, that began to uh, open up these these avenues of understanding our own physiology, f- physiology in ways that we could start shifting our our nervous system, like from sympathetic to parasympathetic. We could start we could start uh, implementing some some micro recovery moments. We could put ourselves into recovery um, uh, uh, states um, uh, on demand, right? And that and that really is the difference between being in sympathetic response and a parasympathetic response, and understanding how those systems worked in our physiology, understanding how breath breathing and vision affect those systems and really just exploring a bunch of stuff around that genre. And so the mind gym was really an experiment to throw as much cool, as many cool things as we could into one room and have guys start, start practicing and trying stuff. I don't know where it sits right now. I'd have to talk to my buddies who are still in there. I'm not sure if it went too much farther down the road. Um, but, uh, but it was certainly a, it certainly helped open our eyes up to some of those newer mental techniques that we could use to uh, both recover in in the moment, like like I call recovering between gunfights, like micro recovery, but also like, okay, starting to learn a little bit better on how to, once we're done with the act, 
uh, being more deliberate about our, our recovery, both mentally mm-hmm. and physically. Because like, you know, and again, you and I talked before this and, you know, one of the pitfalls that a lot of <clears throat> high performers fall into is this idea that we get seduced by the accomplishment, right? And so once we we work, 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 we accomplish, we're like, oh man, that's awesome. What's the next thing, right? right? Yeah. And we immediately jump to the next thing, but we never recognize that gr- true growth is going to require recovery. If we just jump into the next thing, it's like it's literally like you and I going to the gym every day and lifting biceps, right? Yeah. It's not gonna, it's not gonna work, right? We have to let that muscle recover, right? So, so uh, opening up that aperture for for guys, understand that, hey, be deliberate in your recovery after after you accomplish. That allows you to grow. It allows you to reflect. Allows you to to become better. Um, that's essential in the process, and so that's a little bit what the mind gym was doing, which is a little bit of the struggle. And you, you talk about this in the book and I thought it was a great lesson. Um, I think it was, was it from your mother that she said, if you have a success, don't, Oh yeah. 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 Don't sulk in it for more than two minutes. Same with if yeah. something negative happens. So that the, the two minute rule, the that, two minute yeah. rule. And I thought that was very profound in thinking about it because oftentimes we have a success and we kind of bask in it. And you also bask in failures for, for way too long. But that brings up the question is the balance. If let's just say you accomplished something hard and you're proud of it and you have really two minutes generally to kind of celebrate it, you want that feeling again. So how do you balance those things? Well, first of all, the two minute rule. That was a, 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 one of my best CEOs. It was his grandfather who taught oh, him. Got it. And then he taught us <clears throat> this idea when, when if something bad happens, you have two minutes wallow kick the dirt do whatever you need to do excuse me and then um as soon as you can get back get back to business right same thing if something good happens rest on your laurels celebrate do whatever you need to do get back to it um the two minute rule though when it comes to practicing resilience needs to be in the context of little what i call little tragedies okay um because there are things in life that happen bad things and good things that bad things we need a lot more than two minutes to effectively recover from and good things we need a lot we want a lot more than two minutes to effectively celebrate right so so certainly the two minute rule is not to be applied to large trauma or even large successes take a little bit longer recovery oftentimes recovery true recovery needs to be almost two or three times the length of the accomplishment, right? Just think about weightlifting. Okay, you and I go and we, we lift for half an hour, okay? We say we do arms for a half hour. Well, we take usually two days before we right. lift arms again, okay? So those muscles that are torn can repair. Same thing with, with goals, right? So so recovery always has to be longer than the accomplishment. But, but, but practicing resilience on the little tragedies can help us exercise that muscle. These are things like the the bad day at work or the spat with the loved one Got or that the the being late for a meeting or traffic or whatever those are little tra- spilling the milk okay those are little tragedies that you can take yeah. two minutes you can practice the resilience or like i don't know what a good thing would be uh maybe you won the five dollar lottery or you i don't know you 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 made it two minutes early to a meeting whatever those are um take two minutes on those little tragedies to to exercise the resilience muscle so that you understand what it's going to take for the longer stuff because the longer stuff does require longer recovery. Uh, I want to get to the uh, interview process because I promised that. But before that, uh, going back to the mind gym for a second, mm-hmm. I'm obsessed with like techniques on how to overcome or reduce stress, like how to yeah. overcome anxiety or reduce stress in situations. I can't think of learning as much as I can from a Navy SEAL like yourself on yeah. how to do that when things are coming at you and you just have to relax. One of the things that you had talked about is this peripheral vision exercise. Can you touch on that and then anything else? Yeah. So, um, so what we, first we have to understand the, um, the difference in our nervous system between the sympathetic system and the parasympathetic system. Sympathetic system is really what's engaged when we are engaged. Okay. And it's really quite, um, rough on our physiology. Again, designed to be. It engages us for action, right? Sympathetic is a misnomer. It's not really sympathetic at all, right? But it's it's effectively producing adrenaline and cortisol and all these things that get us moving um, versus parasympathetic, which is known as the rest and digest system. That's really when we're in recovery mode. We're, we're producing things like acetylcholine and, um, and DHEA, which are the building blocks of testosterone and estrogen. Well, what what people often don't realize is we actually have more of an ability to shift between those systems than we think, and we can do that by reversing the process. When we and what, what, when I when I say that when we 
get anxious or fearful, okay, for example, our pupils begin to focus in, right? We start to focus in on the threat, okay? We get tunnel vision, okay? So one of the things they discovered is that if you go open gaze, right? So this is now, I'm not focused on anything. I'm just maybe looking forward and I'm not really staring at anything. I'm just almost noticing my whole periphery, right? That's open gaze, right? Our body immediately starts to shift into parasympathetic, right? Mm -hmm. This is why we're looking at a horizon is so relaxing or people who live on the beach report to be healthier, right? Because they're, they're more often in open gaze than someone in a city, okay? Um, that helps shift physiology. Uh, same thing with, um, there's, uh, EMDR, which is lateral eye movement, mm -hmm. uh, something that that's been studied. Um, moving our eyes from left to right laterally actually helps us shift into parasympathetic. This was, if I get the science correct, my buddy Huberman will, will correct me if I don't, but, um, but I think there was a, there was a, a researcher who was, uh, who would take walks in the woods and find that the walks were relaxing to a level that they he, he or she didn't understand. And what they realized is because when you're walking in the woods, their eyes were, his, their eyes were constantly kind of going back and forth, shifting between things. I don't know what that is, but but they realized this EMDR actually works. So so lateral eye movements work. Um, and then breathing. You know, again, w w the one thing that's happened when we're stressed or anxious is our breathing rate rapids, right? And we we get short, or they get shorter. Um, controlled breathing helps us actually de-stress, especially if we're doing what what's called like CO2 blowout breathing. The more CO2 we're blowing out of our system, the more relaxed we're actually getting. What people don't realize is like when we hold our breath, um, that urge to breathe, when, when we start getting that urge to breathe, it's actually not because we're out of oxygen. It's because we have too much CO2 built up mm -hmm. in our system. This is why when you're a SEAL or you're doing, or these, these free divers, learn that you can actually push past, so you can push past that that, that inertia, initial urge to breathe. So you, you have oxygen in other areas of your body. So you actually go a lot longer than you think. Um, you just have to be able to push past that urge. Um, that's because CO2 build, is building up. As CO2 builds up, it stresses out our system. So so long, long breaths where you're blowing out a lot of CO2 help you relax versus like say Wim Hof breathing. Great way to breathe if you're trying to amp up, right? Wim Hof breathing is yep. like amp you up and get you all fired up. That's because you're doing shorter breaths, right? It's getting you really deeply into sympathetic versus parasympathetic. So yeah, breathing techniques and visual techniques can help actually help us de-stress in, in shorter moments. Have you been in a situation where you had a hard time controlling your breath? I ever? No, I haven't. And I think... Um, I think, uh, I don't know why that is. Maybe because I was just trained. Because <laughs> you're steady. Yeah, I, I, yeah just, I'm, just, I'm, I'm steady. I mean, I, I, I guess you, you train to a level where you, you go in and you just, you decide on steadiness. You know, our our default is calm, you know. And um, and it's funny because, you know, I, I joke with you, you're, you're here at the house and I joke, we have, I have a seal who lives across the street. I have a seal who lives down the street yeah, to the right. Four. Had a seal who lives down the street to the left. He just recently moved. But but my wife used to say, she said, used to say, I'm so glad these guys are in the neighborhood because if anything happened, I could go to them and they'd act like you act. And I said, what do you mean by that? She's like, well, as soon as something happens that's stressful, you immediately calm down, right? And you start working the problem. And I realized that's actually what you learn to do in these environments. You learn to just immediately calm because that's where your conscious mind is engaged. Yeah. If we're not calm, we're not thinking consciously. The more at amygdala hijack is ramping up, the more our conscious mind is coming offline and our, and our kind of our limbic system is going to act without us thinking, well, that's bad. <laughs> you know, yeah. in any situation where you're, where you're, where life, you know, well, it's not all the time bad. I mean, if you see a lion run, whatever, but, but, uh, but certainly if you have to think your way through, you need your conscious mind online. So, so yeah, I'm typically someone who, who, who pauses and calms first, you know, and, um, and that typically allows a better decision-making process. So I'm not saying I, there've been certainly situations where I've felt uneasy, you know, but, uh, but never to the extent where I, so if you're measuring your heart rate at that point in time, it wouldn't have, you wouldn't well, I don't like... know. That's a good question because I'm not sure how much the heart rate actually has to do with, with how much O2 or, I don't know. I have to see yeah. what that, you know, I mean, maybe the heart rate went up, who knows, but again, I guess it does, right? I mean, the, the yeah. cool thing is if you watch the space, the shows on space where Neil, Neil Armstrong and the, the Apollo 11 stuff, and they have the heart rate measurements and you can, they're they're watching the heart rates, and Neil Armstrong was notorious for having a pretty darn good heart rate, even in the most gnarly circumstance. He just kept calm. That guy kept calm. Now, didn't mean it wasn't like up in the one twenties, but I mean it certainly wasn't like the one eighties or or, or, yeah. or higher. So so I would imagine that the that the heart rate for most of us stays fairly even, you know, um, through most of it. So yeah, that, that's incredible. 
I, I was just thinking this. Uh, I didn't know turning on the street, but it's probably one of the safest streets in America. It could be. There's, there's, <laughs> I would imagine there's probably more here in the area that yeah, have more yeah. seals on it. You know, it's probably Delta Force <laughs> that you'll never know. Or, there might be guys. Yeah, but that's the thing. You know, you never know. So uh, that's yeah, probably funny. not a good, uh, <laughs> good place to try anything. So I, I was telling you over the years, I've, I've uh, now my company's up to 800 employees, which is hard to believe. Yeah. But I've personally interviewed. Uh, hundreds of people over time, candidates. And I found it super fascinating to think about the job interview process and how broken it is. And this was like five or six years ago, I tried to use uh, what I call people analytic data, where Mm -hmm. we would ask a series of questions to high performers in our company, and then uh, let's call it mediocre performers. And then I would try to model those questions to then when we ask new people coming in, like how would they answer them? So then we could get some predictability and it didn't work very well. Um, (laughs) And so I tried like all these things to predict because it's such a waste in in businesses and in companies if you hire the wrong wrong person for training and it's it's not necessarily great for them either because it's the wrong fit on both sides. So it's really important to get a good candidate. How... What is the ideal job interview? God, well, that's going to be again subjective uh, to. Or how can you apply? Yeah, yeah, you have to you have to apply attributes. So the first the first task is to figure out which attributes you're looking for. Okay, because that matters. And then the task is to say, okay, how can I effectively test these or look for these in the context of what I'm asking of the candidate? So the example would be like. I always find it hilarious when some of these businesses want to go down to like California and throw their, do like an offsite with like seal instructors and do like surf torture and all that stuff. Cause I want to, you know, you know, see how gritty everybody is. Well, throwing a bunch of accountants into the surf zone <laughs> and freezing them is not going to tell me how good they are in the accounting world, right? Uh, just like throwing a bunch of seals in, a, in an accounting problem is not going to tell me how good they are in combat, right? So, so it has to be contextual. So figure out the attributes and figure out a contextual environment. So the, the example I like to give, because it's fairly simple and straightforward, would be, say you and I wanted to hire someone who was good at sales, okay? You and I could tell this person on a Friday, hey, you're going to come in Tuesday morning and you're going to sell us this water bottle, Okay. Um, and then we come in Tuesday morning and that person stands up in front of us and gives us a kick-ass presentation on the water bottle. And you're like, man, that was awesome. That person is really good. We would not have learned that much. All we would have learned about that person is that person's really good at preparing and presenting a sales pitch. That's all we would have learned, right? So instead what we do is we say on Friday, hey, you're going to come in Tuesday and you're going to sell us this water bottle, right? And Tuesday comes, right? But when they show up, we say, okay, the plan's changed. You're not going to sell us this water bottle. You're going to sell us this pencil. And oh, by the way, there's no audio visual, like all that's out. So you have to do it. You have to do it on the fly. Okay. At that point, you and I have to very deliberately divorce ourselves from skills assessments. Okay. Cause what we're about to see is going to be ugly. Right. But we're looking at attributes now. Okay. We're going to see how this person reacts. Is this person adaptable, open-minded? Is there, are they humorous? Do they roll with it? Do they kind of go on the fly? Are they funny? I mean, it might be ugly, but how do they handle it? Or do they kick the dirt? Do they blame? Do they kind of make excuses, right? Now we're looking at attributes. And so any um, hiring process that you want to implement attributes, first of all, should be protracted, right? It can't be just an interview, right? Because questions can only do so much. So you want to, you want to, you want to protract it across a, a myriad of environments, okay? So whether that's a, a office environment, might be a social environment, whatever, and have people talking different situations, and then try to implement some challenge, uncertainty, and stress. And it doesn't have to be Machiavellian, right? I mean, it can be mm-hmm. it can be fairly manageable, but it has to be contextual, and it has to put some people in a little bit of discomfort and uncertainty, so that you can start to see some of those attributes, whatever that attribute is that you're looking for, right? Um, whatever that list is, um, it can get fun actually if you start thinking about it. If I want to find, yeah, I want to see if I want to see what per- someone's accountability is, like how do I measure that, or or I want to see what someone's humility is. How do I measure that? I mean, there, there's cool ways you can start thinking about this. This is another some of the some of the work we do with organizations. We help them figure out some of these processes they can do contextually to what they're looking for. Because again, I could I could throw a bunch of people with, in the surf zone and freeze them or or put a boat on their head, but it's not going to tell me much about <laughs> right yeah. what they're doing. No, it's I mean, it seems like this would be a great place for investment for any HR business function to look into this and then model the jobs next to or have these attributes next to the 
the job. So everything's yeah. kind of together and then you know what you're looking for. And then you ask specific either questions or put tasks in front of those candidates that are relevant for that job experience. Right. Yeah. So what we do, and then also understand like, so what we do is we'll, we'll help organizations a figure out what attributes they're looking for. Okay. What, what is that? attribute? So first of all, separate, what is the job? Separate that job into skills and attributes because that's important, and then start saying, okay, what are what are some of the things we can do to look for those attributes? But also, what are the what I would call the the mission mission essential versus the mission enhancing attributes? Mm-hmm. That's a military term, right? Mission essential is, hey, if we don't have this, these we will fail. That's like a seal going out with it without his gun, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. it's not gonna, or, or jumping out of an airplane without a parachute. A parachute is a mission essential piece of gear for jumping out of an airplane. Okay. Um, what are the, what is that, what does that list look like? That's going to be a smaller list. That's going to be like one or two or three things. Okay. Cause not everybody's going to have all of them. Okay. But you want everybody to have at least a couple of them, whatever the organization decides, um, or the team decides, but then you say, what are the mission enhancing? And these are the ones you can plug and play, right? You can have one candidate that has a couple, another candidate has a couple other ones, and then you can start zippering them together as a team. This is where the person who's patient and the person who's impatient work together. This is a person who's competitive and non-competitive work together or, even, you know, adaptable or slightly less or more stubborn, whatever that is, right? Yeah. You can start zippering those together. So that's that's kind of how you do it. So um, the book came out in January. It's crushing it. Congratulations. You. Um, if you, now that it's been out, I can't help but think that um, you've learned a lot since it's come out. If there was, a, if you're going to add another chapter to the book today, yeah. what would it be? Well, it would be probably what I wanted to when I first started thinking about it, and that would be to write about how these attributes interplay with each other. Um, but what I realized was that is that is such a huge topic that it would have been a thousand pages long, right? right? Because it's so hard to to get it all captured, right? So, but these do they you know that you can you can be low on one and high on another and realize, oh wait a second, I'm okay. Like someone who's low on adaptability, right, but very high on open mindedness, that person's probably going to do okay, okay? Because even though when, when the environment changes without their control, even though that feels icky, that open-mindedness would be like, okay, well, but I'm open-minded enough to see how it goes. I mean, there's a, so these things can play off of each other in very interesting ways. And so I had thought about starting to write down those roads, but it would have taken a long time. We're looking at how to maybe do that. And we're, we're always constantly trying to improve the assessment tool. So we're looking at maybe how, to, how do we improve the assessment tool? So perhaps give people more of an in-depth read on, hey, this is how your scores can actually work inside of your life because you're coming up here high here and low here this is how it may look for you in everyday life so we're going to try to do it that way awesome how can people find out more best place is where you mentioned theattributes.com there you can find uh, more about me more about the book you can do the assessment tool we have our workbooks there if you want to you know get us for speaking or or consulting it's all there um you can buy the book there are links to go buy the book as well so so theattributes.com is is the best place and they my instagram handle is there and my my LinkedIn handle is there and all that stuff. So, so yeah, that's probably the, the one-stop shop. Awesome. Well, I highly recommend this. I learned a ton and just even more through our conversation. It's been an honor to get to know you and thanks so much for having me in your house. This is the first <laughs> podcast I think I was telling you that I was invited to, to Rich's house with his wife, uh, Kristen, made a, made a wonderful uh, lunch and we've got to spend uh, the uh, late morning together. So it's well, been amazing. Thanks for coming. It was really, I'm really honored that you came all the way and uh, it's been great having you. Great to meet you and glad to, glad to be friends now and we'll stay in touch. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you, brother.